Today we're talking with Pamela C. Dean, a writer from the Minneapolis area who has published six novels and a handful of short stories. As a member of the Scribblies, she participated particularly in the Leavec anthology series of, sh of short story collections set in a common shared universe world. But I think she's probably best known for her novels, the, uh, uh, the Secret Country trilogy, which began with The Secret Country, published uh, some Nin years ago now. 1985, I think. And uh, continued in The Hidden Land. Here's a new cover on that. And uh, finally, The Whim of the Dragon. And then she went on to write uh, Tam Lin, The Dubious Hills, and Jennifer Gentian and Rosemary. And we'll talk a little bit about some of her forthcoming work um, a little bit later. Well, let's get started by, by mentioning the, the background of, of maybe the Secret Country trilogy. Well, I started writing it when I was 15 and was heavily influenced, in fact, by Lewis Carroll's um, Alice books. My initial idea was that the entire interior story would turn out to be like the end of the Alice books, where Alice says to them, you're nothing but a pack of cards, and everything sort of flies up in the air and she wakes up. But this did not turn out to be feasible. Lewis Carroll could do it, but I couldn't. Um, other background is um, things that my brothers and I did it in childhood. We played um, this kind of imaginative game, sort of a precursor to role-playing games, but without any kind of dice or cards or board. We just made stuff up, assigned each other characters, and went with it in a kind of impromptu theatrical performance. Um, and the rest of the background is literary. It's everything I ever read from the age of four. I'm still discovering things that are in there that I didn't realize. People always ask me, well, what are the influences? And I'll rattle off 10 or 12 books. But they are, they are multifarious. They're multitudinous. I don't think I'll ever get to the bottom of it, because I don't always remember things. So some of the quotations that are there are not entirely inserted, huh? That is correct. There's um, a website called The Annotated Dean, which attempts to um, catalog all the quotations. And he kept coming up with things that he thought were quotations. And I would say, I think I made that up. And then I would think about it some more and write back to him and say, no, actually, I didn't. I believe that's T.H. White or whoever. And that website is one that I wanted to mention today. It, it covers not only the secret country, but also um, Lynn, yes, that's right. right. It does. And I think he's working on the other books. But it's, it's a finicky and tedious process. And he's, it's simply a labor of love. So it proceeds at the pace that it has to. I don't know of another writer who inserts so many quotations throughout the fiction I I as you do. And it works marvelously, especially when you um, are coming up with magical spells and so forth. And so you use the, the quotations because they aren't quite in your voice and they often have sort of a ring of authority on their own. Do um, you ever worry about Horace's caution to people about be careful about quoting other people because you may make your prose look bad in comparison? I worry about it all the time, but um, it is so much effort not to quote that I have simply given up on it. Um, I'm also encouraged, I don't know if I should be, the two main authors from whom I got this habit or from whom I was reinforced in the belief that you could have this habit and be a writer are E.R. Edison mm -hmm. and Madeline Langell. And of course, saying I'm encouraged by the fact that E.R. Edison does this is very hubristic because his prose style is unmatched and unique. But Madeline Langell, although she's a very good writer, um, has a basic prose level that's more modern mm -hmm. and, um, and neutral. So I feel that if she can do it, maybe I can do it too. I think it's mostly her fault that I decided this was a viable literary technique. I'm thinking of A Wrinkle in Time in particular, where there's one character who talks solely in quotations, and other characters who quote when they feel like it. But Mrs. Um, Mrs. Which speaks entirely in quotations. Yes. And I was much struck with that at the age of 11. I remember that now you <laughs> mention it, but I hadn't thought of that as a precursor to what you're doing. It so definitely is. Um, as long as you're mentioning precursors in that way, what, what are some of the other 10 or 12 books that you think of? <laughs> yes, today's list. Um, definitely Lewis Carroll. 
um, a couple of young adult fantasy novels by a British writer named Barbara Slay. They're um, Carbonell, The King of the Cats, and The Kingdom of Carbonell. Um, a couple of Andre Norton books, primarily, oddly enough, Moon of Three Rings, which is science fiction, but which has an otherworldly feel about it and has a lot of landscape in it. That's mm -hmm. definitely a precursor to the, some of the secret country stuff. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Um, I started to write a fantasy quest novel with a female hero instead of Frodo when I was about 14 or 15, and that luckily did not get anywhere. But um, the secret country books are definitely informed through and through by Tolkien. I had read Tolkien in excess of 30 times by the time I finished these, so you can't possibly not be there. Um, Louisa May Alcott is another very early influence. A lot of her dialogue influenced mine in a way that it's hard to describe. We've mentioned Madeline Langell. Um, T.H. White, The Once and Future King. Mm -hmm. His dialogue also. The, the my dialogue is a weird amalgam of, um, of White and Carol and um, a couple others, but it, sometimes it's very hard to keep to keep control of the way these people talk, given that they're supposed to be contemporary children. Um, Shakespeare, we would have to mention Shakespeare as an influence. When I needed a plot line for the interior story, for the game part, I stole shamelessly from Shakespeare and simply pushed the responsibility off on my characters, which was very convenient. Um, Robert Heinlein, his, especially his juveniles, especially things like um, Have Spacesuit Will Travel, which was my favorite Heinlein as a child. And um, I'm blanking on the names. Space Cadet. There's something, I think that's the one that has um, a number of scenes set on Venus. And again, the, the alien landscape and the alien characters somehow feed into the magical creatures in the secret country, even though, again, that is science fiction mm -hmm. and has, to most readers, a really different feel. But he was a very strong influence. Also, although I would never dare to do the kind of authorial voice that Heinlein got away with, um, it was an influence, nevertheless, that usually had to be damped down a bit, mm -hmm. since I don't talk the way he does and don't have the same set of certainties that he did. And I, I guess that's today's list. That's a pretty good list, <laughs> I think. Um, your prose is probably one of the reasons that so many other writers have mentioned you as being a writer they particularly admire. I think that's especially true of your fellow scribblies. Um, I think they almost all have cited you in a way that they haven't all cited everyone else uh, among the scribblies. Oh, maybe you should men we should mention that the scribblies were a writer's group that you were part of earlier in your, your um, the start of your career, as a published author anyway, and which I think you're still affiliated with a few of them still. Yes, everybody has moved away except me, but we, um, we occasionally get together to critique things and we exchange email. And there were originally seven of you, of six of whom published novels very quickly in the late 80s? Um, it's still, let's see, actually mid to late 80s. Steve Bruce, no, Pat Reedy sold her novel first, and I think it came out in like 1983. Okay. And then Steve Bruce sold, and Will Shutterly sold, and then me, and then Emma, and then Emma Bull, and then Cara Dalkey. And we were so all through, starting about 1983 and going right up into the 90s, first novels were coming out, and second and third novels. Mm -hmm. you, you've actually published fewer novels than most of the others now, and I think you've probably had a little less in the way of commercial success, um, even though you have this sort of critical appreciation from everyone else. Is that a kind of, how do you feel about that? It's trying. Yeah, that's really true, especially of the later books. The Dubious Hills and Juniper, Gentian, and Rosemary got really, really good reviews. Um, but the sales on the last one, the sales on Juniper, Gentian, and Rosemary were so bad that nobody has wanted to pick it up for reprint. All the other books are going to be reprinted in the next year or two. And of course, the secret country books have been already, but they can't take the risk on the last one because it sold so badly. Um, I think part of the problem is that I didn't keep up a steady production rate. A book a year is better. 
-hmm. And the other part is, I don't know, Emma Bull, who has not actually written as many novels as I have, and who is one of my favorite writers in the entire world of all times, um, has a style that is somehow, I don't know, it's more contemporary, it's more rich and vivid, it has, it has a kind of streetwise quality. That's not all she does. She can be as lyrical as anybody, and she can be as plain as bread, but she has, and it, she has a range that I don't. And I think that, um, in just in terms of prose style, I think that a lot of the reason that I have not done as well as she has is that she has this greater range. Mm -hmm. She can appeal to a much broader range of people. She's, um, she is much more fearless about her subject matter, too. She's not quite as completely fearless as Steve, but she's quite close. Mm -hmm. I particularly admire the the, Genti, the Jun Juniper Gentian and Rosemary book. I thought that was in many ways the the most daring, I guess, of the books that you wrote. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that you can characterize it with a, a genre label like, um, I mean, it is fantasy, I guess, but uh, I, I thought it was a book more about being a teenager, maybe, or growing up, or uh, wh what did you what did you think of when you wrote that? It was certainly about being a teenager. I wanted um, to write about a group of friends that I had when I, well, two groups of friends, actually. One that I had when I was 14 that was pretty much broken up when my family had to move 500 miles away, and another one that I had in high school, which I managed to hang on to much better, as it's easier when you're older to keep in touch with people. And I wanted to talk about the impact of having a group of friends like that who have consciously agreed to support one another about the impact that would have on on extreme emotional situations like being tempted by the devil, <laughs> which is um, more or less what happens. Um, I also wanted to talk about being at a point where you're deciding what side of your character to pay attention to. Jenchen wants to be a scientist, and she's very much fixated on being unemotional and rational and logical. She has kind of a, a Spock complex. But she's also 14 and the victim of a lot of chemical and emotional forces that she doesn't understand and really doesn't want to deal with. And I wanted to look at that both in the viewpoint character and in her friends and see what it, what it looked like. But there needed to be some kind of, there needed to be a plot, there needed to be some kind of anchoring structure. And I stole that from Child Ballad Number One, which is the battle, ba the ballad about um, riddles and about how a young woman finds out she's been riddling with the devil, mm -hmm. but she she gets the better of him in the end by realizing who he is and what he's doing. And that, I, I don't know why that seemed like a really good allegory or parable of a lot of adolescent um, issues all rolled up in one, but it did. Well, I thought it was a, a marvelously interesting book. It's my favorite of my books, but um, at the moment, it's kind of f fallen aside, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I have a feeling that it's a book that um, probably takes a while to understand, because it doesn't, it isn't like Pam Lindsay, which in some ways I think is your most successful book. Absolutely. That is my bestseller. And um, I, I think it's artistically very successful, too, but you know, it kind of fits into the Terry Windling fairy tale model much more easily than I think your other books would. I was thinking a lot about the, the Secret Country, which I had tried to start many years ago, probably when you first published it, uh, having heard you say that um, it's a children's story, like the ones you're citing maybe, like the, the Narnia stories or like the like Five Children and It by, by Inez, but, but written for adults with more texture, you said, I think. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Oh, just more depth and detail. And um, I was thinking about that that quotation recently, in, as I read the, the Secret Country for the first time, actually, and thinking, well, I can see what you meant. I definitely don't think they're children's books. I found the um, some of the ideas and the exploration, particularly in the third volume, very interesting. And at the same time, I think some of this stuff would be boring to at least middle grade readers and even probably a lot of young adults. 
So I'm interested they've been published. They, they now as children's books by Firebird. And I wonder what you think of that. Well, when I originally sold them to Terry Windling, she was editing both a line of adult fantasy and a line of children's fantasy. And after a lot of back and forth, she said, let's publish these as adult novels. They have children as characters, but that's not the only defining quality. And I think because they're so long and complicated, they'll be better published for adults. So that happened. And then over the years, people started indignantly stomping up to her and stomping up to me and saying, why weren't these published in hardcover? Why weren't these published as YA novels so they could win the Newbery Award, which I think is um, a very flattering but not perhaps very accurate remark. And there was just any, any failure to reach an audience, any problem with sales was all attributed to the fact that they had not been published as children's books originally. So um, when Sharon November started up Firebird and wanted to cross-publish them both as YA and as adult books, it seemed like a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't really know where they fall. I have gotten impassioned letters from eight-year-olds, obviously quite literate and, mm -hmm. and precocious eight-year-olds, who just adore them, especially The Secret Country. Younger readers tend to glom onto The Secret Country and say that's their favorite book. I've gotten letters from 10 and 12-year-olds who just love them. But they basically, anybody under 15 or so who, has to, who likes them probably has to be a like me. I was w reading ahead of my grade level, like a lot of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are really interested in books. And I was accustomed to there being a lot of things in books that I did not understand. It was, everything was science fiction to me. It was all an alien landscape, and I just kind of blundered through it, picking things up, maybe misinterpreting things, or just rushing over them if I didn't understand to get to the next good bit. And if you don't like to do that, if you don't feel that a book ought to be a mystery the first time through, that you need to read it again to really understand it, that you need to have a years-long relationship with it in order to really get to the bottom of it, if you don't feel that way as a child, you're really probably not going to like them. Mm -hmm. So I think as much as anything, it's less a matter of age and more a matter of literary personality and just how, how people approach books. Because I, I'm not saying they're not fun the first time through, because if you have a particular taste, they are. But it's really unlikely that anybody reading them only once is going to get out of them everything that's in them. Mm -hmm. And that, that, was the, that was the impetus behind writing them, too, because I had rediscovered about, at the age of 25, a whole lot of books I had loved as a child and never been able to own. And when I found them, I was just ecstatic. And then I read them. And lots of people have described this, um, this process of becoming reacquainted with childhood loves. But they were short and straightforward. And everything that had been so mysterious to me was perfectly clear now that I was not mm -hmm. a 10-year-old. And what I wanted was books that would not succumb to that process, that would always retain something that wasn't quite focused that wasn't quite contained within the margin of the book. But there are lots of people who perfectly legitimately do not have that kind of taste in literature and want something else. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure to what degree that's a, an age distinction and to what degree it's just a matter of taste. How much of the, the world in the secret country, and I suppose also in the Dubious Hill, since it's ultimately set in the same world somehow, um, comes from your own uh, stories that you told with your brother. Anything, or is it just all created kind of as an, an analog to those stories? Those stories did not really have a world building in them. They had some kind of a various different stereotyped um, backgrounds, usually gleaned more from television mm -hmm. than from books. And um, they were all about character interactions, mostly. So I would have to say that the, the background world of the Secret Country books is, again, predominantly literary. It's this big amalgam of Greek mythology and Shakespeare mm -hmm. and anything else that I or the characters after a certain point happen to have read. But it doesn't really partake much of the imaginary landscape that my brothers and I had because mm -hmm. we were more directly influenced by television. Mm -hmm. You'd have to look at The Man from Uncle and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Sea Hunt and 60 shows like that to really to really draw mm -hmm. that experience out. So you mostly constructed it as a basis for these books as you wrote? Yes. Okay. I just wasn't sure because, you know, Tolkien had all this stuff that kind of 
was there, and then he went to write The Hobbit, and it kind of snuck in eventually. And I wondered if there was an analogous process. No, there's not. There's more a disjunction. Um, having said that, after publishing the Secret Country trilogy, you came. You, you you went on to write The Dubious Hills, which, when I read it, I had no idea was related to the others because it seemed so different. Though I had only barely started The Secret Country when when I when I read The Dubious Hills originally, which was years ago now. Um, and so when you had mentioned that, with apparent trepidation, that writing a sequel to both was going to be difficult. That was perfectly obvious to me. Having now read the rest of them, I'm not so sure it should be hard to fit the secret country world and the uh, dubious hills world together when you can, for that matter, fit in the origin world of the five children, which is very like ours, at least in that same multiverse. So, so how is that a problem? And, and tell us a little bit about the sequel. The um, sequel is called Going North. Um, it's due in 2006 and I think will therefore be published the following year. Um, it the main characters in it are Ruth from the Secret Country books who at the end decides that she needs to go off to a wizard's library called Heathwill in order to grow up a little before taking up the, the fate that has been determined for her by the events in the books. Mm -hmm. The other one is Ari from the Dubious Hills who has had to leave because of things that happened in the book. I don't want to spoil too much. Mm -hmm. But they both they have both been told by their mentors that they really need to go to Heathwill. So they will both go there and meet. And my trepidation was not so much the worlds as the characters. It's putting some characters together is just asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. And also, they've both undergone enormous transformations. And bringing them up to those transformations is one thing, but really deciding how they would be affected and how they will go on is another thing that strikes me as being interesting but not altogether easy. But it was really the collision of characters and also some of the minor characters in the Dubious Hills are um, idiosyncratic and opinionated mm -hmm. and yet the dictates of logic demand that they come along as well. So there's a kind of collision of two groups of opinionated characters whose um, current situation has been informed by unique and bizarre events and it's just a large complicated mm -hmm. ball of string to handle. So you don't know if they're going to turn out to be good friends like Celia and Chelsea and, and uh, in The Whim of the Dragon or maybe like the, the women in uh, Carolyn Stevermer's uh, College of Magic oh who my. are terrible enemies <laughs> by the end. Yes, my plan is the former, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence in it. You can't rely on characters to do what you want. Well, I'll look forward to seeing that in a couple of years. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about your, um, your short stories, particularly the, um, the Leavec stories, and another novel that you're working on that's a Leavec novel, is that right? Yes, that's true. It's called This, this Green Plot, and um, it's just been rejected by one publisher. So, but it's it's useful to have to work on when going north becomes completely intransigent. You can get stuck on one book, go work on the other one until you're stuck on that, and and go back and forth. Um, the Leavex stories were fascinating to do. It was a shared world, largely invented by other people, and um, that gave me a lot more scope. I am not a short story writer. It is not my natural form. It is a terrific struggle to do a short story. It's more work than a novel. It's not more writing time, but it's more thought work than a novel. So the Leavex stories, given that I didn't have to invent the world, it gave me more time to figure out how to tell a story in a smaller compass. They actually, they are a kind of shadow novel. They all involve the fate of one family, mm -hmm. and they they chronologically proceed from one another. You could make it like a 75,000 word novel out of them by publishing, publishing them together with a little bit of um, interlineation to connect things properly. Um, the other short fiction is very scattered. Um, one story I firmly was written for Jane Yolen, who did not want anything longer than 5,000 words, and it was squinched down by the fact that I based it on a ballad, and it's the shortest ballad in child. I later found out that the one thing Jane said when she bought it was, you could turn this into a novel. And I'm saying, no, no, no. I just deliberately chose a subject that was not a novel. 
But she was right. It could be turned into a novel. Um, let's see. Then there's Owl's Water, which is simply a historical footnote to the Secret Country books. Mm -hmm. And there's one more. Which appeared in, in Xanadu. Technology. Yeah. Edited by Jane Yellen. Xanadu, the first one. She did, a, I think, a couple more. So. Yeah, there were three altogether. And the last short story is called This Fair Gift and is in Sisters in Fantasy, which was edited by Susan Schwartz. And um, it's not like any of the others. It's a contemporary story about a law firm in, in a world where magic started working sometime in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And I really like it. It's also based on a ballad. It's based on one of the Arthurian Christmas court ballads. I can't remember which one now. But that was the only way to squeeze things down, mm -hmm. was to either write a novel about a family and divide it up into separate threads or base it on a plot that doesn't have too many ramifications. We really haven't talked much about Tan Lin, um, which is, as we both mentioned, was probably your best known book, and uh, is really a marvelous uh, book set at a sort of alternate world uh, Carleton College. Yes. And it sort of idealizes a, a college experience uh, as a freshman and then going on from there, right? Right through to fall term of senior year, yes. It's not quite the whole four years, but almost. How much of that is your experience? Um, the first couple chapters are my experience. After that, the characters took over, and um, my classes are there. The classes I took are there, but aside from that, it's really not my experience at all, except that it takes place in a, a very similar physical location. Um, once you postulate that the um, classics department is actually the unseelie court. Um, even if those people are based on real professors, everything takes off in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite relieved, actually. I did not want to write an autobiographical novel, and I'm relieved at the degree to which I did not do so. But you did clothe as a novel the, the, the ballad of Tam Lin, too. Yes. Which I think is just a fascinating juxtaposition of these two things. It's sort of a wish fulfillment about the most wonderful college experience, although it kind of goes a little bit sour with the unseelie court and the evil fairy queen, but um, but at the same time, it's also this exciting story of Tam Lin retold. And yeah, that's the, the dark underbelly of, of <laughs> even a really magical academic experience. Although I'm not sure that that's not entirely, uh, not a part of, of uh, college experience either. I think it is. Yeah, the, um, the real world aspects are really good. And the bad aspects of the college experience are spun off into the supernatural part. But there, there didn't seem to be any better way to represent the, the bad aspects of any four-year experience. Um, we briefly touched on your uh, stories, the Leavitt stories. And I think you have a short story coming out. Yes, I do. It's going to be in an anthology called Firebirds Rising, edited by Sharon November, being published next spring. And it is a Leavitt story although it is not connected to the previous ones. Okay. Um, I had a very opinionated character who was not getting enough room in the novel that was rejected, so I gave her a short story to express herself, and it's, it's very peculiar, and I'm really fond of it. Well, I hope that eventually someone will pick up the Leavec novel, perhaps after the other one appears. Thank you. I hope so, too. And I've enjoyed talking with you today, and thanks for coming to TV Bookshelf. Thank you very much.